thank you very much for the kind introduction and inviting me here. I'm very excited to be here. Um, this is my first time in Thailand. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of Thai food and uh, I, yes, I also see a lot of similarity between, uh, I'm from Vietnam, I see a lot of similarity between Thailand and Vietnam, especially the language actually. Uh, the, uh, it, not the writing, but the phonetic sound. In many cases, I, in, in many cases I, I, um, I'm sitting on a bus and then I hear some people speaking some languages. I hear some, I recognize some sound, but I don't understand the meaning and then turn around and it turns out to be Thai instead of Vietnamese. That's that how similar it is. Like I can be uh, mistaken Thai for Vietnamese. Um, okay, so, um, so, uh, you know, uh, I'm an assistant professor at Stony Brook University and it is part of the State University of New York. And this is a public system with 64 campuses around New York State. But most of them are community college and there's only four or five of them are actually research university. And Stony Brook is one of the four, or uh, we call the flagship university in, for New York system. Um, uh, you know, in the summer, I also am full time in 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 in, in Vinayai research, uh, starting from this year, and uh, I will tell you a little bit more about that. Um, so, a part a little bit about me. So, I'm uh, uh, I did a postdoc at Oxford University in the UK with Andrew Zisserman, and uh, my PhD in robotics. Uh, I have an academic brother uh, from Thailand. Uh, I can't pronounce his full name. I know everyone call him Ot, but uh, uh, every time I have to look up his paper, I have to go to the website of the lab and figure out the name because I can't remember his name, right? <laughs> um, uh, and uh, I, did, uh, I got my bachelor degree uh, from uh, Univers uh, University of New South Wales in Australia. Uh, I also have uh, previous affiliation either at intern or consultant, uh, consultation for like Facebook research, Microsoft research, Google research, and also uh, APT information system. Okay, so let me uh, advertise a little bit about Stony Brook University. So this is the map of United States, and the red is, oh, is uh, basically New York State. And uh, if you zoom in New York State, this is Long Island, and uh, the thief of Long Island is essentially New York City, so I am not in New York City, but in, uh, we are actually in the middle of Long Island, and um, this is uh, State University of New York at Stony Brook, and this is basically computer science building. Um, so my research, so uh, uh, I'm interested in computer vision and machine learning, and the main focus on human detection and behavior analysis in images and videos. Uh, I've been teaching uh, uh, graduate courses in computer vision, machine learning, uh, robotics, and also undergraduate robotics. Uh, currently, uh, my lab, I have seven PhD students, four master's students, and uh, we have uh, high school students uh, visiting the summer as well. This is what the lab, you know, a part of the lab looked like in 2017. Uh, now, so the graduate computer science program at Stony Brook University, we have people coming from all over the world, but I, I don't think I met any Thai student at Stony Brook yet. Uh, so uh, for the graduate computer science program, we have both the master program and the PhD programs. Uh, the master program is quite large with 250 students per year, and most students have job immediately after graduation. And most will earn more than their professor, okay? Um, and, and Stony Brook is actually ranked very high in terms of return of investment. The, the tuition is quite low compared with many other universities at the same uh, level. Now, the PhD program is fully funded with tuition wave, and we pay our students currently around 33,000 uh, per year, just for the stipend. Uh, uh, and application round fall and spring, uh, of course, to apply, you need uh, the normal stuff, GIE, top four, good grade, recommendation letters. Many students now come with research experience and even publication, right? Uh, 
Uh, we also encourage diversity. So if you are interested in coming to Stony Brook, please do talk to me. At, please do apply and uh, talk to me if you, uh, you are interested in. Okay, so uh, part of me also is, uh, for, uh, I'm also working for Vinaya Research, which is a newly established research uh, institute in Vietnam. Um, and uh, essentially, there's, there's three pillars of Vinaya. So we have a core research group, which have a like, focus on research excellence, top tier publication. Uh, and we also have a group for AI residencies. We do have, uh, quota for people coming outside from Vietnam. So if you are interested in becoming an AI resident, spending there for one or two years, working towards some research paper, applying to top school in the US, I think uh, I encourage you to apply. Okay. Uh, so at the moment, I'm also at Stony Brook University. I'm, uh, I'm recruiting for a postdoc and also PhD student. Uh, at VNAI, we are looking for full-time computer reason, uh, researcher. Um, which we must have already have uh, PhD and we pay competitive salary to, um, yes and also the thing that some of you might be interested in is this resident program where uh, we, 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 we will train the student and give them the real research problem to work on for, for two years uh, so they have experience and knowledge to apply to be competitive to uh, enter to the programs in the US too. Okay, so before I start my uh, talk, I have to say that uh, many slides that I'm going to show you are borrowed from other presentations. Usually what I, I do is I start from the slides that I, uh, if I have to teach a topic, I look at for many set of slides, I start from them, and eventually I modify all of them. But I have been very sloppy at keeping track of what I modify and what, where I copy from, so I apologize for that. But um, the percentage of my own slide is about 70 to 80 percent. Okay. Um, okay, so now, so what is computer vision? Uh, we all, um, I guess, uh, um, you all know. So. so computer vision is an inverse problem of image formation. Uh, to compute, uh, it computes the property of a world like either in 2D or 3D for more, uh, one or more digital images and the type properties could be geometry, motion, or recognition. Uh, but why vision? First of all, we use vision because they are light. And vision is how we see other people, how we navigate our environment, how we communicate ideas and entertain, and also how we measure the world around us, right? Uh, we use light because, uh, you know, light is, is plentiful and sometimes are free. Sometimes they are not, okay? Uh, and it's also light interact with many things, but not too many. So that's why there's, you know, there's still a signal coming out from that. And it light goes generally straight over distances and also the wavelength is very short, so you can actually have very high spatial resolution. Light is fast, but not too fast, so we can have something like time of flight sensors. Uh, also this day, uh, it's easy to detect. We have cameras that are very cheap, the like indoor pocket, you know, cameras everywhere, right? And also light come in flavor, in different color, you can have even like very high intensity, high energy X-ray beams that you know can look at things at at molecular and nano scale. All right. Um, okay. So why study computer vision? First of all, computer vision has a lot of application, and many of you have been exposed to computer vision application. You have face detection on the phone. You have face verification on the iPhone. Fingerprint on the Android. Uh, phone, you know, computer vision used for security, healthcare, robotics, surveillance, you name it, right? Uh, also, you know, we, one reason for study computer vision is there are a lot of jobs out there. Here is the list of sponsors for CVPR to, uh, 2019, which just happened like a month ago, right? And this is a list of sponsors. And you know, my company got on the list. You know, that's the, the tiny bit here, but you see that many, uh, many dozen of other companies there. 
if you're lucky enough to be at CVPR, you see that you know this is basically a small corner of CVPR where uh, they have the entire floor just for exhibitors, and then uh, you know there's so many companies will be there. And 10 years ago, 20 years ago, the company come to uh, CVPR to sell you something. Now they come to CVPR to buy. Do you know what they buy? They buy talent. They want to recruit people. It's very hard to recruit people these days in this area. You know, if you have experience in machine learning and computer vision, yes, you're going to earn like at least six figure or m multiple of those in uh, easily. Uh, not easily, but in many of the. <laughs> okay. Uh, my student can get offered like three times, two times my salary for sure. Yeah. So. Um, Another reason for study computer vision is there are a lot of challenging science and engineer questions, uh, problems there. And it is actually a continuum between something, you know, vis computer vision is visually intuitive. You, know, you can, can focus on application, you can be application oriented, or you can study something like, you know, where the deep fundamental problem, the scientific mystery in uh, learning and perception. And for anyone, anyone can find the right level of comfort in this continuum. You know, if you are more to mathematical inclined, you can work on the fundamental problem. If you want to build application, yes, you've, there are a lot of application that you can develop. Uh, this is a list of basically, uh, 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 because there's so many challenging uh, science and engineering problems, you see the number of submitted and accepted paper of CVPR. Uh, from you know, 30 years back to this year. And you can see that in the last three or four years, it has increased exponentially. And in no time, we don't have any big, bigger venue to hold the conference. Uh, many conferences, they, they sold out the, uh, uh, the, the registration in 10 minutes or something. It's like a rock concert. You, know, you have to be there within five minutes to buy the ticket to the rock concert. This is how hot it is this day. OK. All right, so computer vision is part of image science, and there are some other topic or related area of, uh, 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 of image science. One is image processing. It basically, from image to image, how do you remove noise, in enhance image? Uh, you, uh, another one is imaging, coming from physics to image. How do you capture some uh, reflectance uh, or uh, some other property of material, right? Uh, computer vision is related to graphics. It, uh, graphic is coming from symbol to image, and computer vision is the opposite, basically, from image to symbol, right? Uh, this day, if you work in computer vision, many people will want to collaborate with you because you know, I have people from uh, mathematics department, engineering, uh, psychology, computer science, they all want to collaborate with computer vision. This is the area that can bridge multiple areas, very interdisciplinary. You can work on something with deep like, you know, psychological or like cognitive science uh, uh, to solve cognitive science mystery or something very mathematical, like involve optimization, uh, the, the surface of the loss function, and, and things like that. Or engineering problem, how do you run phase detector for 10 cameras at the same time in real time? OK, so why is computer vision challenging? Uh, is basically, imagine you're describing red or ugly to a blind man. And the input to a computer is nothing but a, you know, an array uh, or, or some sequence or an array of numbers in 2D or 3D function. Uh, you know, so suppose this is the image. This is what look uh, uh, what the computer really see. Okay, and then uh, if you look at this type of function, it doesn't make uh, you don't see a lot of structure in it. Now, we, we perform, we as humans perform uh, the vision task with amazing speed and accuracy, but not effortlessly, right? Because uh, uh, in, in, in uh, cognitive science and also neuroscience, they have studied, and 50% of our brain is doing vision. A lot of the neurons are dedicated to solving vision, when, which is substantially more than what is involved in doing math, okay? Uh, is see, seeing trivial, 
So this is an image, it's a static image, but you probably see it kind of like some, it's something moving, but uh, yes, yeah, so that's a visual, it's a well-known visual illusion that trick you. Um, this is another uh, illusion, so which of the cell A or B, which one is uh, lighter, A or B? Well, B is obviously lighter here, but uh, it's again, this is an illusion. If you put uh, a vertical bar here, you actually A and B have the same color. But the fact that our eyes interpret A, B is lighter than A because we are used to seeing the checkerboard pattern with black and white, so we tend to associate the white uh, cell uh, have uh, you know lighter than the darker uh, cell of the checkerboard, right? Uh, this is the image that become viral about two weeks ago. So this is uh, uh, in, in social media. So this is the image. It's actually a grayscale image, but there are some horizontal line, color line has been overlaid on top of it, and you actually see the image as as if it is the color photo. Okay, uh, this is very new. I think it's two weeks so or something like that. Um, Okay, in many cases, the things that you can recognize do have any immediate connection with the, each other. So, for example, if you see these three disks, you tend to see a triangle, but they don't even connect with each other. Uh, here's another example. It looks like uh, a set of random dots, but if you look carefully enough, some you might see a dog in the middle here. Do you see it? Uh, so this is the leg, and then this is the head of a dog, okay? All right, so uh, how about this picture? Uh, which, of one, uh, which of these two correspond to a face, or what do you think? Left or right? Right. Who says right? Raise your hand if you think the right image corresponds to the... All right, I see about 30%. How about the left? Okay, another 30%. All right. So by, uh, by the union rule, I think more than 40% don't think that neither of them correspond to a face, right? Okay. Actually, both of them correspond to uh, a face. And in this case, you see that, you know, one, the top one is... Uh, the man face and the bottom one correspond to the the face on uh, hang on the on the wall. Um, well, the fact that we can recognize this at face is because based on the context around it. So essentially, what define an object is not what inside the object, but the contextual surround that help it or help our brain to recognize is they are faces. How about this case? You know, all of these patches are actually correspond to the same set of pixel values, but under different situations, you're going to interpret them differently. They have exactly the same pixel value. So on the top left image, you might see as you know the beer bottle. Uh, it might be of uh, you know this one is the phone. Uh, this is the shoes, but they are exactly the same. So um, so. This really, what does this really say? A uh, information about an image is not, or the way that it, we interpret an image is more than what contained in the image. It's more like also our uh, prior uh, knowledge and perception about what we see around us. Computer vision is not hard because we don't know what is it, a chicken and egg problem. We don't know whether we go from low level and high level vision. You know, given an image, do you? you know, process from the pixel and then to the edges and to the structure of the scene, or you recognize the object first and from that you recognize the boundary, the pixel, the light in the object. So, so that's the chicken and egg problem, which one go first and then how, how does we as a human process the visual information? In many cases, what you define an object, these are some things that most of you never seen before, but somehow you can associate them with object, right? Uh, uh, with faces, so... Okay, so... Um, computer vision is also very difficult because there's many nuisance parameters here. 
in terms of illumination, object pose, the clutter of the background, it can have occlusion, intra class appearance, viewpoint changes. Yeah. Some other challenges is the intra category variation. If you want to build a, a chair detector, you can see the variation in the class of chair. You know, they, these are called chair, but they have, they, they vary a lot in terms of appearance. Okay, now let's talk about some common, uh, common computer vision task. Uh, the first one, the most common one, I would say, is image classification. Given an image, we want to classify it into several predefined image category. Is it a dog, a cat, or a bird, right? The second type of uh, problem is object detection. Can you detect uh, you know, the common object or the set of objects in an image? Car, traffic light, bicycle. Uh, uh, the next one is object instant identification, and one example is to face identification. Uh, not only you want to detect the face, you want to recognize the identity of the object, or in this case, the face. Uh, one common task is that you also semantic segmentation, which is to give every single pixel. Uh, uh, a semantic label, whether it's a person, road, car, traffic light, or something like that. Uh, 3D reconstruction, given a set of images, we want to reconstruct the 3D structure of the scene automatically. How do you do that? How do you uh, reconstruct the 3D point cloud from a set of images from tourist uh, photos without calibration, without registration uh, when they, they took the photo, right? Uh, another problem is image matching and retrieval. Suppose that you go to uh, a scene, you take a photo, you want to recognize what type of, uh, you know, where, where is it taken, or you want to find out all the information in that particular scene. So it's part of image matching and retrieval. Um, and some of the successful application in product search, Google has product search, when you take, you snap a photo of a product, and it might, you know, or Google or, or Amazon, they find similar product on their website uh, or, or on the web. Image generation. Uh, GAN, this is a hot topic this day. Uh, we can generate like uh, uh, fake celebrities, these are not the real celebrity, but has been generated by computers, right? Uh, how do you train a generate, uh, generative model? Object tracking, how do you track an object over time? Uh, um, you know, tracking is a fundamental problem and is also uh, kind of like uh, the foundation of many applications, right? You can have foreground, background subtraction. Suppose you have a surveillance uh, camera. We want to detect the changes, the thing that moving in the scene. Uh, okay, and uh, you know, says if you deal with images and video, you might want to build something to recognize the action and activity of people in the video, right? All right, so, um, so what I just finished is the part one of uh, a number of uh, uh, my lecture when broken to multiple parts. So I finished part one, and uh, part two, I will be uh, talking about image filtering, convolution, um, filter bank, part three on CNN for image classification and segmentation. Uh, I know that many of these has been uh, covered by uh, Rachel uh, yesterday and today. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to see cover a lot of stuff. I know that some of this will be repeated to you, but at the same time, I think, um, uh, you, you know, some, something new, something old, and it's, uh, it doesn't hurt to get some certain important concept to be reinforced. Uh, at least that's how I learned. So uh, you, you, you see some old and new stuff, that's something, old stuff that you have seen before, but then hopefully you find something new and useful. Uh, for this afternoon lecture, I'll be talking about object detection and object tracking. And for tomorrow, uh, depending on how fast we move, we can uh, keep uh, talking about this topic, or I can tell you more some advanced topic on my current research. All right. Um, okay. So, any questions so far? Okay. Let's uh, continue our journey. So, 
part two, it can be uh, filter and convolution. Um, so, okay, so convolution has long and rich history starting from signal processing. So let's just review some basic about convolution. All right, so uh, first of all, uh, uh, an image is essentially uh, as can be described as a function and a digital image is basically a sample of the 2D space on a regular grid. And then you quantize each sample. So for sample being delta, you know, distant apart, then it's a quantization. Uh, you have an image. And the image, it could be a, a basically a matrix of integer value. It might have three channel uh, for the color image with three channel and three dimensional vector for each location i and j, right? Uh, let, let's talk about something very classical in terms of image noise. Now, images are corrupted, usually corrupted by noise, mostly during the, during the acquisition process. And we can have signal processing technique can be used to model and remove this noise. So image restoration is the removal of noise. And the noise here can be additive noise or source and pepper noise. Uh, for example, here, you know, on the left is the uncorrupted images. On the right, the image has been corrupted by some uh, random Gaussian noise. So at every single pixel, there's some noise that has been added or subtracted uh, from that pixel value. Uh, you know, image filtering is, uh, can be used for noise reduction. And uh, in the general process, is you form a new image whose pixel are the weighted sum of you can use linear filter, it's one way of removing noise. And linear filter, uh, the general process is to form new image whose pixel are a weighted sum of original pixel value using the same set of weight at each point. Okay? Uh, the example of linear filters are the average of pixel in a neighborhood, the Gaussian smoothing, which is basically the weighted averaging where the middle of the Gaussian have higher weight than the surrounding region. And you can use some in other type linear filter could be derivative, and you see some of the other filters soon. Now, so the property of linear filters, in the first of all, is the linear. The output is a linear function of the input. Second, it is shift invariant. The output is a shift invariant function of the input. Uh, that means that if you shift the, uh, an input image two pixels to the left, the output will also be shifted two pixels to the left. Okay. Uh, for noise reduction, in a lot of the cases, you know, we need a, a noise model, and one of the noise model is uh, Gaussian noise. And essentially, at every location, it corrupted independently of any other location. So the noise at one pixel is independent of the noise at you know, the next pixel or any other pixel in the image. And the, uh, the distribution of the noise is a Gaussian with some, uh, maybe some, some, some mean and variant, mean mu and variant sigma has been added to, to corrupt the image. Uh, so some of the basic assumption here is the noise, uh, noise process is independent identically distributed, you know. Uh, they independent each other, and then they, uh, it, it is a random process that, you know. Uh, and the second assumption is the image has more regular underlying structure than the noise, you know. Uh, the image, actually, the structure of the image, uh, you know, the pixel is actually dependent on each other. The noise are independent of each other, but the value of the pixel actually relate to each other. So that's what it means. It has more underlying structure. Now, so by considering a larger neighborhood, we can separate signal from the noise. Uh, for example, this is an image uh, uh, as of two-dimensional function f, x and y, and it's the two pixel has been corrupted. One is in the middle of the, you know, the 90 here, and one is uh, outside it. Okay? Now, so you can use a moving average to suppress noise. So what moving average is, uh, uh, is that to replace the value of the middle pixel by the average of everything uh, in the image patch. For example, the, if you replace it, uh, the middle one in the top corner box, is going to be zero because every value has zero. 
you can move it to the next pixel and this this case uh, the next value 10 and 20 and then you can do it for every single location okay oh, sorry. okay so this is the this is basically the results that can be obtained by you have uh, doing taking the moving average uh, in this image. Now, so moving average is a simple uh, or one example of something called the correlation correlation filtering. So, say the average window size is let's say two uh, k plus one by two k plus one, then uh, the average. Um, would be is that sum over all the pixels in that uh, in that windows and divide by the total number of pixel. Now, so this is uh, the every filtering can be you know you can have different weights for the uh, for, for for taking the, the the function. So in this case, let's say every uh, location has slightly different weights, and the weight can be uh, specified by a, something called the kernel function H and U and V. So essentially, there's a kernel, you move at every single step, you take the dot product between the kernel and the uh, corresponding location, and then the result could be the value that you replay for the pixel in the middle of the patch. So correlation filtering can be denoted in H, you know, uh, this symbol uh, with F. Now, uh, filtering an image essentially is the following. So you have uh, a kernel H, uh, the filter kernel, or the H equal the, the 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 filter, the kernel, or the mask, and uh, it is the prescription of the weight in the linear combination. So to get the correlation filtering, what you do is take the edge, you move at every single location, and you take the dot product between the corresponding patch. Okay. Now, so that is correlation filtering, and it's different from convolution. Convolution is different. Convolution is uh, actually we actually inverse the signal. Uh, so essentially. It, you, you pay attention. It, it's very similar to correlation, except that the index has been invert. Before it's a, uh, it were f i and f uh, j, uh, but now it's actually um, i minus u and uh, uh, j minus v. Okay, uh, there's a, a typo there, but okay. Anyway, uh, but so the so for the convolution, suppose this is the kernel h. The first step is you basically you um, invert uh, the app, both, you know, or flip uh, edge both horizontal and vertically, and then do the correlation, cross correlation with the function f. For the convolution of continuous signal, is uh, you know, it, convolution it, it doesn't have to be discrete. You can define it for continuous signals too. Okay. Now, here's some fact about convolution. First of all, it's a distributive operation. So if you have a signal x, you can convolve with a linear combination of y and z. So you can actually do, uh, uh, you can distribute, you can convolve x with y and x with z. So this is called the distributive law. The second property is the commutative operation. Uh, x convolve with y is the same with y convolve with x. Then third one, also important, is associative operation. Essentially, um, uh, I convert with Y with Z, you can do Y uh, convert with Z first, or I convert with Y first, and then convert with Y. Convolution in the spatial domain correspond to multiplication in the frequency domain, and this property is often exploit to make it fast, okay, to, to, to reduce for computational efficiency. We talk more about this uh, later, okay. Uh, now, uh, the difference between convolution and correlation. Correlation is essentially to find the things that correlate with the things that you're looking for. So the thing with the high git response value is the one that looks similar to the filters that you are doing the correlation with. You have a kernel, if you do the correlation, essentially the one with the strong response is the one that's similar to what you do the correlation. So correlation is very quite intuitive. It's more intuitive than convolution. But the, at the same time, convolution has one property that makes it more attractive than correlation. Is it convolution is associative, while correlation is not. What that means is 
the associativity of convolution is what allow us to do what we call the pre-convo. Suppose that you have to convo an image with a kernel F, with a kernel G and H. So what you can do is pre-convo G and H and then convo with the image. And imagine you have to do it for thousands of images like that, then you can do the pre-convolution of the kernel first, and then you convolve with individual image. So that is a nice property of convolution compared with uh, correlation, okay? Now, convolution is the most important method to analyze digital signals, and in general, it's a fairly expensive uh, operation requiring a large number of computation on typical images. But because this is so uh, important, many computer architecture provide specialized instruction for this kind of operation, even before GPU. You know, a CPU, they also have special instruction for convolution. And nowadays, it's also part of GPU, it's also a big part of GPU. Uh, it can be done in parallel, and it is considered fast, but uh, you know, compared with other operations, it's still not, you know, it's it's fairly expensive still. All right, so the common kernel for noise reduction, uh, you can have the mean filtering in this case. You know, every value in the kernel had the same width, the uniform width. You can also use a Gaussian filtering where the shape of the Gaussian or the value in the, in, 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 in the kernel is basically distributed like a Gaussian. It's a 2D Gaussian here. Note that the sum uh, for, for filtering, for noise reduction, the sum of the width should, should sum to one. So here an example, this is the input image. If you convert with uh, uh, average kernels, this is the result that you get. If you convert with the Gaussian kernels, this, you, yeah, this is uh, the corresponding results. Uh, the average kernel tend to keep more kind of blocky Feeling because you know you can see that it also the kernel is a zero or one and it not while the Gaussian it tend to smooth out towards the boundary so it's also a bit smoother at the boundary of the object. Um, actually, um, uh, there's some interesting property of linear filtering. One of the questions we know the smoothing remove noise, but can you prove it? Can you actually prove that linear filter actually remove noise? And yes, you can under some, some certain assumption about the IID assumption of Gaussian noise. You can prove that, you know, uh, suppose that the, the noise had uh, uh, zero mean uh, with a uh, variance, then the mean must be also zero because it's the weighted sum of zero mean normal random variable. And also the variance of the noise of the new, the resulting pixel is actually uh, smaller than the variance of the individual pixel that you started with. So if the kernel uh, is k and the value of the k is kuv, if we know that you know uh, sum of kuv equal to one, but the sum of square is actually smaller than one. So that's why the variance of the noise after you do the convolution will be smaller than the variance that you started with. So under this model, you actually uh, uh, the noise at every location after doing filtering will ha also still have zero mean but lower variance. So that means you remove the noise. Okay? Yeah, or sorry, you sub. Um, reduce the noise level. Um, okay, so uh, of course, this is under the assumption that this, uh, you know, there's some structure in an images and the surface turns slowly, so the averaging of neighboring pixel doesn't really change the signal, but it reduces the noise, okay? Um, okay, so um, also there's the size of the kernels that you use to do the convolution or filtering also affect the noise value, uh, or uh, if it's the smooth, you know, the larger you make, the smaller the noisy, but at the same time, you smooth the signal. Uh, if you can use uh, convolution to reduce, and, uh, you know, remove noise and do smooth thing, you can also use convolution for sharpening. Essentially, if you can separate the input into the quartz and phi signal, and if you make the output at the quartz and you intensify the phi component, then you have something to sharpen the image. So any filter 
which remove file detail can be used to sharpen an image. Uh, what you can do is first you figure out the file component, which is the input minus the cross component, the smooth out version. Once you have the file component, you just magnify it, and then uh, this, this is the equation. The output is input plus file multiplied with. So recall that uh, convolution a distributive. So if you converge G with the sum of the two, a you know you can uh, you can put it as uh, uh, the sum of the two uh, of the signal G convolved with the kernel A and B. So essentially, you can figure out the kernel to do sharpening. Uh, it's a single kernel that can be used to sharpen an image. So uh, essentially, it's the following. You have the identity and you have the average kernel. If you subtract the two, that is the kernel that can be used for sharpening an image. Okay, so this is because of the distributive law of convolution. So this is the origin. So for example, this is the original image, and this is the one that has been sharpened by convolving with the sharpening filter. Uh, here's another example of uh, sharpening using sharpening filter, highlighting some fine uh, fine details. Uh, here's another ex uh, application in. Uh, in, in medical image radiology, when you uh, highlight the high frequency, uh, emphasize the high frequency, and using also with histogram equalization to see the structure of the image. Okay, so, so far we have used convolution for image enhancement, basically removing, removing noise, sharpening images, but we can also use convolution for feature attraction and essentially to attract the you know, important points, the edges of the region in an image. To do so, we just need to use the appropriate kernel for the convolution. For example, if you use the, you know, uh, these so two examples, the one on uh, the top left, and the top left of that image has the kernel. Um, and then if you convert the kernel with the image, and then you see the positive responses, essentially, finding the pattern that look like the kernel in this case, okay? And the bottom one is looking for the kind of like diagonal, uh, the edges in the diagonal direction when you convert with the image. So these are the, uh, the bottom right image show you the positive response by converting the kernel with the image. Uh, one important part, you know, another type of important for Convolution is the derivative uh, kernel. Uh, in this case, we want to find the derivative of a 2D function. Remember that we consider an image as a 2D function, and the derivative is, you know, the definition you, you all know is a partial derivative with respect to the horizontal or the vertical direction, and you can approximate it with the discretize. So it essentially, it, the derivative is that subtract the neighboring pixel is in the uh, X or the Y direction, all right? So this is obviously a convolution. Essentially, you convolve the image with the kernel with a sing, you know, two value, one and minus one. Now, there's also this other approximation of derivative filter exists. For uh, the gradient is DF over DX or DF over DY, but there are multiple type of uh, derivative function, you can have the robot uh, um, filters, which is essentially compute on the uh, diagonal direction. You have the so bell, three by three, or pre-width, that's shown here, all right? Uh, so, uh, all right. Uh, so here, so some uh, final differences, example of an image, and then, uh, on the bottom here are the two images that convert the, the, the original the input image with the X on the Y direction. So which one correspond to X and Y? Uh, so so essentially the one with the vertical edges is the one that correspond to the uh, I think the horizontal. Uh, and this one is convert with the Y direction. And this is the basically the the strength of the the edge, or it, it's the magnitude of the gradient direction. Uh, so the gradient has two component, with one respect to x and one with respect to y, and it's the vector, and it's called the gradient vector at that pixel. 
and the gradient point in the direction of the most rapid increase in intensity and the direction of the gradient is uh, given by the uh, inverse of the tangent between the two vectors and the edge strength is basically the, um, uh, the L2 norm of the gradient vector, okay? Now, not long ago, um, what we, uh, in computer vision, we all use image descriptor based on gradients, and specifically based on histogram of oriented gradient, and two representative uh, descriptor equal Hawk and SIF, and they all build on the same principle. You first convert the image with a uh, uh, gradient kernel, and then you compute the direction of the gradient at every single pixel, and then you compute the orientation of that gradient direction, and you put it into the corresponding orientation. For example, here. Um, okay. So, for example, here, if you look at this, this square here, so every single pixel has been computed a gradient, a gradient is a vector, two-dimensional vector pointing to some direction that of the most increasing intensity. And then suppose that you consider eight different directions, you know, point to the right, point, um, let's say, point to the east, point to the northeast, north, uh, north, West and and then you count uh, how many pixels that pointing to this direction. This will be the descriptor for this particular patch. Okay, so this is called the histogram of oriented gradient. And I would say five years or ten, ten years or even five years ago, this one is extremely popular. And this is the building block of computer vision. But this now has been replaced by deep learning. But uh, anyway. Uh, now, um, okay. So also uh, the Gaussian filter also there's also the uh, there's also there's the the variance or the kernel size also control the blurring of an image. If you use something with high uh, width uh, or high variance, then you blur the image more. Uh, what happened when you convert in, in in the old day when you convert an image with a derivative filter, you actually increasing the noise level, okay? Just because you see that, you know, it's one and minus one, and the variant is going to be, uh, the variant of the noise when you do this operation will be magnified instead of suppressing. So the very first step when you do convolution with a derivative is to convert with a smoothing kernel. You need to remove the noise first before you actually do the convolution with the derivative. And so, essentially, the first step is convert with the Gaussian and then convert with the derivative function. And we also said the convolution is commutative, so you can also actually pre-compute or pre-convert a Gaussian kernel with a derivative function, and this is called the derivative of Gaussian filter. And this is the type of kernel filter that uh, has been usually used for, for convert with image. You never convert with a, a discrete one minus one, but it convert with derivative of Gaussian filter because it tend to suppress the noise. Here's the two example or you know the derivative of Gaussian filter and this is what it looked like. Okay, so not long ago, a lot of the research in computer vision is to design a set of filter banks that are good for uh, the downstream task. You can, you know, you, you probably had heard a lot about Gabor filter. There's something called the Textron filter that describes the uh, uh, texture information in image. Like, so the Schmidt filter, Long and Malik filter. So all of this, you know, it's called the filter bank. Um, and uh, uh, the filter bank were designed manually. You start with the great, uh, the set of filter bank and some desired property, property of the filter bank. Is they are compact complete, relevant for the task, noise tolerance. So once you get the feature response at, at for each filter bank, you have a feature vector and you do some quantization, orientation, quantization, and you build a descriptor based on that. So uh, the first step is do filtering or convolution. The next step is to build a descriptor on top of that. So this is kind of a very handcrafted, manually designed, it's very shallow structure, and uh, but 
it is also part of some things that uh, will bring us to the next uh, part of the lecture on convolution neural network where this step has been automated and it's a deep architecture uh, for, for okay now so in summary what we talk about is some basic about the filter and convolution which are the fundamental building blocks of image processing and image analysis uh, convolution has long and rich history with also deep mathematical connection um, uh, uh, convolution has some property like it distributive, associative, commutative. It's also shift invariant, kind of translation invariant, but it is not scale and rotation invariant. Okay, so keep that in mind. So when you have to process an image, suppose you have to detect an object, if you scale up and down the image, the result might be different. Okay, suppose that you cannot detect face is very small. If it's uh, increase the size of image, you might detect the face that you miss. As that, uh, that actually, um, okay, or you rotate a little bit, or you some do some random rotation or whatever, you can also increase the size of the short training data. So it's called the data augmentation. All right, I've been talking a lot. Uh, any question? Yes. Um. Okay, so um, so this is this equation. Suppose that every single uh, pixel has uh, the noise of the uh, um, uh, so zero mean and the variance is s. Okay, if you apply a kernel k when the value of the uh, of the kernel with KUV in this one, then the variance of the one after you apply the kernel would be S square multiplied with the sum of square of the value. Now for the average kernel, you can see that this one is going to be smaller than one. So it means that you suppress the noise. Okay, But for the one that is actually derivative one and minus one, you actually increase it because it becomes two now. So you actually uh, magnify the noise. So one way is try to smooth it first and do the convolution. So you reduce the noise. OK? okay thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'm not quite sure if I'm right or wrong. Uh, the, the terms convolution, convolution in computer vision and the deep learning is seem like it's not the same. Is it right? Because in convol convol in computer vision, it seems like we have to transport the kernel before we do the multiply. So, but yeah, so so uh, I think it uh, it comes to the specific implementation of the library that you are using. Uh, you, you probably don't have to distinguish between convolution and correlation in this case because it's that you know uh, as at the end of the day, you just learn the filter width, and then it, you know, if you just flip it left and right and up and down, this is going to be the same thing. So uh, I'm not sure what the library actually implement convolution in the right way, or they actually use correlation. But it doesn't matter that much in in those library. Yes. Uh, about the associative uh, property of the convolution, why, why the convolution has this property and not with the correlation? Uh, I don't know. The math uh, say that. Okay. So convolution, uh, convolution correspond to uh, the point-wise multiplication in the Fourier domain. Okay. So in the Fourier domain. But correlation corresponds to multiplication of the signal with the, um, uh, the, the conjugate of that signal, of, of the other signal in the domain. So correlation is not, does not preserve that property. Convolution is a, it, it's at the product point y multiplication and it preserves. That all I can say, I don't know. You have to look at the math, I guess, to prove it. Yeah.
Uh, I'm not from the image uh, area, but I'm working on the NLP, and I use some uh, image featuring technique like Shift, Soft, and Hawk, something like that. Uh, generally, what I understand is that kind of feature are still useful for general uh, image recognition, you know, and image-related research work. Is it correct? For, for uh, let, let me know hear about your current. I, yeah, uh, I think the most of the cases you should be able to find uh, deep learning feature that work uh, for the task. Uh, that. Uh, Essentially, there's a lot of people who work in visions this day. If, if something that has not been done with deep learning, they would jump on it. Uh, yeah, so yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm pretty sure whatever you need, you already have some form of deep learning features for that task. Yeah, uh, especially, uh, let's say, I'm working on the under resource or languages like uh, I did some small experiment like uh, finger spelling or sign language recognition for Myanmar sign language like finger specking recognition. So at that case, we have a very limited amount of uh, image data. Even we call it you know, two, three years, we have uh, some you know, limited amount. So are there still any uh, possible way to use uh, deep learning or how about your, yeah? So, so what is the application you say, so is that uh, sign language? Yeah, yeah. And uh. like the finger spelling, uh, uh, let's say we have a finger spelling in my Myanmar language also, so Myanmar sign language also. We try to recognize uh, by using changing the some features like shift stuff. Uh, basically, that work well. So okay, yeah. so um, yes. Yeah, so uh, what you do doing might be right, but I I don't know because I don't work on it. But if I have to start, I would start with from a pre-trained network, train on something called the Justin data set. They have about like twenty million or just some amount of like hand gesture, about 30 different gesture, hand gestures, that might be a good network to start with, to attracting the features. I see, thank you for your suggestion. Yeah. So, so it's like a transfer learning, right? Yeah, it's like transfer learning, but you, we want to start from the pre-trained network that's relevant for the task. So, Cornelia, uh, what I would like to know is, yes, I use sometimes was transfer learning, especially for the feature extraction. Uh, but I really use on the last layer, uh, if you have any opinion, like transfer learning, mainly I use for only future extraction. So how about your experience on transfer learning in your image area? Uh, can I get some more idea? Uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think you are jumping your head up my you slide. I will plan to talk about it later. Great, great. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so let's uh, uh, resume our discussion here. Now, um, so this part is on about convolution neural network and for image classification and semantic segmentation. I know that uh, part of this has been covered yesterday, but I think uh, it doesn't hurt to get some concept reinforced here. Okay, so not long ago, uh, as I said, in computer vision, we all use handcrafted image feature, which are based on, you know, uh, convolving an image with a, um, a, a filter bank and then building a, uh, ha using handcrafted feature. Here are the sum of the many descriptors that you can use. Sif, Hawk, Touchstone, Glove, Spin Images. To, um. But all of this has now been kind of superseded, like replaced by <coughs> using neural network to learn the features. And the idea is you use convolution to learn low-level feature, and you learn mid-level feature based on learning the filter for the low-level features, uh, responses, okay? And then you have many, many layers of that, and then you train a classifier to recognize some certain set of classes, and then the low-level, mid-level, and high-level filter will be learned automatically if you have enough data. Uh, but this requires a lot of many tricks and efficient implementation. So uh, convolution neural network has been around for 30 years, but it did not take off until we have a, a large-scale visual data set and we have efficient GPU implementation. So, uh, so from fully connected to convolution uh, network, so given uh, we get an image, which is like a, a high width um, tree, which is the number of channels. 
you can convert, you have a kernel, you convert, you convolution, uh, which is moving it different location, uh, and you get a feature map responses, okay? So this is a feature map for a single kernel. A single kernel convert with image, you have a single feature map. But uh, you can do it, you can have multiple kernels, and then in here you have a set of feature maps. All right, one correspond one feature channel correspond to one feature map. Okay, so given an input, suppose this is the kernel when you do a convolution, which is essentially moving at different location and convolve with the input. This is the feature map that you get. Uh, right now, you can get another type of feature convolve with the image, and in this case, you get a different feature map. All right, so. As the number of feature maps will be the same with the number of um, kernels that you use. Um, so, come to the next layer. So, you have the convolution kernel acted on the set of feature maps from the first layer, and then you do it, uh, you repeat the step. So, in general, the key operation in a CNN are the following. You have the convolution, uh, uh, which are the, the weights of the convolution kernel are learned. And then, it, uh, because uh, convolution is a linear operation, so people tend to apply some nonlinearity after doing the convolution. Otherwise, the composition of two linear functions is not the linear function. So, at some way, you need to introduce nonlinearity. So nonlinearity uh, these days uh, tend to be, uh, you, know, the, uh, you know, if you don't know what to use, then the default choice would you to use the rectified linear unit, uh, ReLU. And there's a step called the spatial pooling where uh, you can use like, uh, uh, like say, max pooling or to, 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 to reduce the dimension, the spatial dimension of the fe uh, fe feature maps. And uh, that's it. So this is uh, the famous uh, LearnNet uh, architecture of CNN, uh, which were invented 30 years ago. Uh, I think you seen this yesterday as well. And it has a bunch of convolution, uh, subsampling, uh, and then it has some uh, a, a couple of fully connected layer at the end, and then finally have the output layer of 10. Uh, 10 value for 10 digits, of, and this task has been designed for handwritten digit. Um, now, if you fast forward to the arrival of big visual data, uh, which is, uh, you know, that the challenge, uh, uh, w this image net data contain more than 14 million label images of 20,000 classes, but only, like say, more than one million images was used for the challenge, and maybe 1,000 classes used for the challenge. Uh, they held the image net challenge like every year, like uh, I think 10 years, starting 10 years ago. And uh, and in 2012, is a, uh, is, is is a break breakthrough. Essentially, it's like it the first uh, it marked the comeback of deep network and when the method that is based on CNN like outperformed the second best method on shallow network by a large margin, both on classification and detection. And this is called the AlexNet. Uh, and, uh, uh, and the error rate back then was uh, for, for classification was like 15% uh, on, uh, I think, top, top five uh, accuracy. Uh, and uh, uh, people have also looked at the uh, the convolution layers or the feature learned by AlexNet, and you can see that it actually learned the filters that you know uh, look like some of the filter banks that we uh, has been manually designed. So this is somewhat a kind of confirmation of okay, wow, this is the the filter learned by automatically through data actually learn to extract some structure and the data, something that conform with what we learn about uh, how to design a good set of filter uh, or good filter banks. So it looks like Gabor filter or steerable filters in this case. Um, and it also not only that, it also look for the color blobs and some things that you know not uh, not covered by some uh, filter banks that manually design. Um, 
in in uh, so one uh, you know after AlexNet, one of the networks that become very famous is the VGG16 network, which is, um, uh, essentially has uh, 16 layers, and they propose a method and quite uh, with with experiment how to some. They, they lay out some principle for designing and training a neural network and basically replacing a big uh, kernel size by smaller layer of uh, three by three instead of seven by seven conf layer. This is going to reduce the computational uh, bottleneck or, you know, or uh, decrease the computational uh, of running the deep network. And I said um, convolution is a linear filter, so uh, when you, uh, the composition of two linear filters is another linear filter. So in this case, the composition of two three by three filters is basically can be correspond to uh, a five by five filter. So you can actually reduce, and you know, you have to do convolution twice, but you reduce the number of parameter and the operations that you need to perform. Um, all right. Uh, so, uh, ResNet is, uh, sorry, VGG16 is still one of the um, uh, most widely used uh, pre-trained network out there. A lot of people are still using VGG16. Um, uh, I myself don't know why, to, to the extent that there's some work shows that VGG16 uh, had larger number of, um, had more width than some other network, and also it runs slower than other networks. But at the same time, people are still using this. I still see it on paper. So I guess one of the reasons is it's very robust. It it run everywhere. You know, you can it's very easy to run. There's a, and you download, you run it, and it works. Uh, so there's some other network called ResNet, which uh, had been shown to have higher performance, lighter width, but. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, so essentially, uh, if I have to start something, uh, I would you start with the ResNet uh, or VGG16. Those are the two things that you should start first, try first. Okay. ResNet, is, um, I think Rachel already covered it. It's essentially, instead of learning, uh, if you want to learn a function from input to output HX, instead of learning it, we learn the residual which is the one that's subtracted by the identity. One of the benefit of it is if the identity was the optimal thing, then the set of weights is easy, uh, can be learned quite easily. So uh, ResNet, uh, the, the, the invention of residual architecture allows us to train very deep network. People can go to hundreds of layers or even thousands of layers. And uh, there are many types of ResNet you can use depending on the how, how much you want to spend on architecture and computation. You, have, you can download the ResNet for like 18 layers, 34, 50, 152 layers, or even more. So people have trained ResNet on ImageNet and with different architecture. And then you can, you can uh, of course, the, the, the higher number of layers is the more accurate it is, but at the same time, it takes longer to run. All right, so, wow, good. So how to perform image classification? Now, so given an image, suppose that you want to recognize the category of the image. Now, the, if the image category of interest is among the 1,000 image categories of image net, then you are lucky, right? So you can just use this uh, pre-trained network or download some pre-trained network, uh, feed the image through the network and get out the probability score or the categories that it can recognize. Uh, so, uh, so, 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 this this become very simple. This is some a few lines of code in PyTorch or TensorFlow, uh, and then you can get out the probability value for that image. Now, if you have a new categories, the categories that does not belong to the one thousand image category of image net where the network has been trained, then uh, what you can use is use the pre-trained network for feature extraction. Uh, the pipeline is very so essentially is the following. So you take the network, the pre-trained network that has been trained on one thousand categories. Okay, then you look into the network. Then the network had multiple layers. So uh, 
at some layer, you break it into something called the feature extractor, and the remaining layer is called for the classification. What you can do is you cut off the network, the, the, the final layers, the, the last output layer, or you know, few last output layer of the network, and use the remaining at the feature extraction on the image. Okay? Uh, so, and because you don't have a, a categories uh, for, you know, the categories that you want to recognize is different from um, uh, the ones that the network is trained with, you need to have some, like, co collect some annotated training data for the new categories. And then, once you have the uh, annotated categories, uh, uh, data training data, you can, you can pick your favorite classifier in this case, it could be SVM, logistic regression, or any other classifier that you like, and use the feature as, uh, and then train the classifier with the feature extracted from the deep learning. Okay. So this is this is very common, and this is being used almost everywhere this day. Using the pre-trained network as a feature attraction for the network, uh, for for the type of image for the task that you want. Okay, and this is a form of transfer learning. Essentially, you use a network has been uh, trained for some task on the tasks that you are care about. You transfer the knowledge from some task to what you, you care about. Uh, however, what you, you should do is you should use the network pre-trained on the related task. Uh, the, the assumption here that the network trained on the related task also attract relevant feature for the new task. So, so if, if the two type of images are very different, then you should not... Um, it wouldn't work very well, okay? Let me tell you a case study here. So, uh, so I started working at VNAI and when we tried to do some tasks, uh, you know, uh, uh, I have some uh, uh, first year undergrad student and I gave them the task, okay, can you estimate the percentage of people wearing a mask on the street of Hanoi? Uh, air pollution is a big issue this day, and a lot of people wear masks when they go outside, right? So we just want to get out. Uh, the percentage of how many people wear masks at like 7 a.m. at noon or whatever. So this is the task. The assumption we have is we're assuming faces can be detected, uh, and uh, all we need is a classifier for mask versus no mask face, okay? So mass and no mass is not part of uh, uh, image net, so we, we, uh, we need to train our own classifier again. So what is the relevant pre-trained network? What? What could be the relevant pre-trained network? Okay. I'm Yes, so that's exactly what my students started with. They start with it with uh, uh, VGG 16 train on ImageNet. Uh, well, the, f the problem is the space of the natural images and the face are quite different from each other. So they come back and say, oh, it doesn't work very well, okay? So the next thing is they uh, do some Google search and then they figure out, okay, there's something called VGG face, great. This network has been trained on um, to distinguish between TV characters. All right, so this is uh, uh, they extract a lot of TV character from TV series. They train to identify their identity. Okay, they try it. It still didn't work very well. You know why? What's that? Essentially. When you want to train a network to preserve the identity, it means that it should recognize the person with mask and without mask. So essentially, the attribute of the face is not that important anymore. So maybe the identity is not the right thing here. You want a network that trained to preserve the attribute, not the identity of the person. Okay, so, so that, that basically, uh, you need to look for, for, for network, something like that. The same thing, a lot of the case that oh, my students have to work on images, uh, it's called the accurate, uh, or like let's say uh, from, from medical images, uh, radiology images. You cannot start with the network train on ImageNet. You need something to train on something else. 
Okay, so after we fix the problem, my student come and collected about 11,000 images of face with, uh, with and without mask, and uh, they was able to train a network that achieved about 96% accuracy for the images on, on, on the street of Hanoi. And this can be done uh, by undergrad student within, uh, I think, four weeks, four to six weeks. So I think um, uh, that's, uh, that says that uh, to use deep learning and computer vision this day, it, it does take some effort. It does take some experience to learn how to do it properly and how to um, how to uh, address the problem when it doesn't work the way you want it to. But at the same time, it you can hit the ground very fast and get it running, reporting some performance quite 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 soon. Okay. Okay. Good. Now, so what if we want dense label? What dense label here? So, uh, so far, the, the task is given an image and the output is a single label, right? The single output for, for the category of the input. Or maybe, let's say, a hundred, uh, oh, sorry, a thousand categories for the, uh, for the thousand classes at the probability value for 1,000 classes. Uh, but when we want a dense label, essentially, the size of the output is the same size with the input. Okay. Yes, uh, um, I should finish it within five to ten minutes. So, okay. So, uh, so the output have is the same size with the input. So it means that the size of the, and the, the size of the output um, the input can change. So essentially, we need a network that can output a variable size output. So you, you think about a function that can output. The output of the function, you know, is not a fixed size vector. All right. So how do we do that? So uh, in uh, a few years ago, there's, uh, uh, you know, uh, the authors, uh, this author proposed something called a fully convolutional neural network, and this work, you know, uh, published 2015, and it has already did 10,000 citation. Okay. So essentially, what they say, okay. The few fully connected layer at the end, I can turn them into fully uh, convolution layer because the fully connected layer can be think, uh, thought of as uh, uh, at one by one convolution. So I no longer have a fully connected layer that expects some certain input side and output side. That what happened for the fully connected layer? They remove, uh, they replace with the convolution layer, with the input and the output can change. Okay, so that is the kind of the first paper on semantic segmentation, and you know, so because that trick they can do it fast, and hey, they have ten thousand citations. Um, all right, so uh, the next improvement of this is uh, the, an architecture which is uh, called the deconvolution network, which essentially there's two states: an encoder st stage that. Uh, all of them are convolutional operation, and then so for the deconvolution state, it is the deconvolution filter instead of convolution. So what is deconvolution? Deconvolution is the inverse of convolution, and um, so essentially for con convolution, you have the kernel, uh, you have a kernel, and then you take the sum of, or with the sum of everything inside this kernel and then you get the output, okay? Deconvolution is the opposite given from the input image. You replicate, you replicate this pixel to different value with the weighted, uh, with the appropriate weight. And then different pixels are going to have different replication here and then you sum them up so that the inverse of uh, it's called deconvolution, and when you think about this operation, it's actually the same with applying the transpose kernel on the input signal. That's why in PyTorch, the deconvolution signal is called the convo transpose. So uh, the inverse of convolution is applying the transpose of the convolution. Okay. So if you have to implement it, and if you look at the code, so in PyTorch, it's called uh, transpose 2D or something like that. Okay, the next important architecture, a paper that also have 7,000 citations and extremely popular this day called UNET. 
What is Unet? Uh, oh, let's take a look at the previous uh, uh, deconvolution network. You can see that you know the information has been compressed in the spatial domain from you know from the resolution of image to something had very small resolution. Essentially, it loses spatial detail. You have the semantic information at the middle layer, but you lose all the spatial information. So what Unet says, okay. Because the middle layer lose all the spatial information, but for semantic segmentation, I really need the spatial detail. So let me add some bypass connection from the convolution, the embedding step to the deconvolution step. So this bypass connection helps us to, you know, help the network to preserve the input detail at the appropriate layer. And if you go to some conferences like Mikai for medical images day, it's all about UNET. Okay, uh, which is extremely uh, popular for semantic segmentation. Uh, here are some results that you know uh, of using uh, UNET uh, uh, on, uh, on 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 semantic. So each color corresponds to different uh, label type of label. So dog and cat, person, a kind of a pink. Uh, yeah, all right. Uh, I wanted to run this on some images on Thailand, but uh, I forgot to, to take the images when it would work well. So I only have some, you know, uh, some photo from uh, uh, some random photos that I took, and then I didn't take it within my that to include cars. So I tend to avoid cars, basically. Okay, so only people here, and this is how it works. So you see it's not perfect. It tends to pick people quite well. It detects some table. Um, this is the restaurant that I tried to get in. It's called Tipsamai uh, Pet Thai. When I get there, there's uh, 50 people in front of me, and they said that it's the best Pet Thai in Thailand. So if you haven't tried that, you should go there. It's, uh, um, Okay, so how to get started uh, for, for VGGNet uh, or uh, ResNet can be downloaded as part of TensorFlow or, or PyTorch. Uh, for deep semantic labeling, I recommend using DeepLab, which is part of uh, TensorFlow, and uh, installation is quite easy, and you can get this started very uh, quite, quite fast. Uh, so that's it. I, uh, it's the end of my lecture, unless you have some Question. Oh, um, for the fully convolutional neural networks, how is the image upscaled back to the original size? Yes, so essentially, uh, uh, they just learn from this one different width to each pixel here. So, uh, Suppose that this is a vector of 21 dimension, one by one, so you have that the weights that connect with, so there's a lot of weights that upsample it. Okay. Yes. Uh, um, the sample in the first part of the slide, you show the model pictures that generate by AI. Uh, I want to know what technique do they use to generate those models uh, image? You mean the celebrities? Oh, yeah, celebrities. Uh, yes, so it's called a GAN, Generative Adversarial Network. Uh, so it's basically the technique where you input a random vector, crazy, and then it output a face. Uh, so it's called the generator. And to train these generators, there's uh, something called the discriminator that try to distinguish between the generated images from uh, the real images. So the assumption that you have a lot of real images, which we, we do have a lot of face images. Yeah. So you need to have a real celebrity image before generate. It doesn't have to be celebrities, but let's say if you have a big data set uh, of millions of faces. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I want to know the uh, uh, very uh, deep uh, difference between transfer learning and fine tuning. Uh, 
is there any difference in these two things transfer uh, learning and fine tuning is there any difference between them uh, uh, no they are the same basically but essentially yeah fine tuning you also assume that you can transfer the knowledge from the task right so they, they are the same and what about the, the feature extraction well, so there are two, two ways. So you can attract the feature, and then you train the classifier on the feature, mm -hmm. or you can, you can also fine-tune the, um, the grid uh, that lead to the feature. So if you have enough data, you can do the fine-tuning. Mm -hmm. If you have little data for, for, for that task, then maybe fine-tuning wouldn't help much. It might overfit it. Yeah. Uh, I also want to know about the FC layers, fully connected layers. Uh, the latest models uh, that uh, just came up in MATLAB 2019, uh, namely in NASNet Large, it has only one FC layer, but the uh, very, uh, like VGGNet and uh, LXNet, they are uh, having three FC layers. So is there any dependency uh, between the overall accuracy and the FC layers, fully connected layers? Means, uh, is our accuracy going to increase if we increase our FC layers in the network or not? Uh, that I don't know, actually. Uh, uh, mm. I think it's a, when you say a fully connected layer, yeah. is essentially is that convolution, right? So mm. I don't know even know whether they distinguish between the convolution layer and the fully co convolution layer. They all convolution now. Okay, thank Maybe they just call it different, you know. In MATLAB, you, uh, the structure, you specify some names or whatever, so, but, okay. but essentially, it's still convolution layers. Okay, thank you. Hi. <coughs> I have two questions. So the first one is like a practical one. Uh, in the project that you like classify the mass and unmass, can you share us like how they collect the data by themselves? It's are they using it? So, so I, I told my student, like, that go record some videos on the street. So the, what they did was uh, uh, there was four students on the project, each of them records like, many of like 15 second videos. And then they track uh, one frame every uh, second. Uh, uh, they run a face detector to attract the faces. And now they all they need to label a, whether the person wear mask or no. No mask. So they label it like themselves, like click to. Oh, that is fast because the face detection already gives them the faces. All they need to do is kind of yes or no uh, oh, okay. labeling. So it can be done uh, quite fast. And uh, another one is like, I want to know, like, for the segmentation, how like the, the label is like, is this the color of this? I mean. The segmentation is usually. Um, you have a, a, an integer value dedicated for the class. So for example, in Pascal, uh, data sets are 20 labels for like person, horse, table, chairs, you know, 20 of those. And then there's one, one thing called the background class, which is things that not, you know, it, they are object, but we don't, we don't care about or we don't have label for. Is this label for like, is the area of pixels? Yes, every pixel. Oh. It's a label, so it dense label, so it's kind of very uh, expensive to collect. Too. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, image net network networks like uh, ResNet and InceptionNet, uh, they they may, they are mainly designed to detect uh, one thousand classes. So, uh, uh, I want to I want to. Uh, make a model that can detect only one class uh, by using transfer learning. Uh, at the same time, I want to make the model as efficient as possible. So, uh, 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 in that situation, uh, uh, how can I make these uh, these two things to come together? Like, uh, uh, should I just uh, de can I decrease the uh, convolutional layers in the feature extraction network? Uh, so to make the uh, computation much more efficient, because I just only want to detect one class. Uh, at this case, what should I do? Yes, yeah, so another uh, hot area in, uh, in this day is called network quantization. There's a lot of demand for streaming down the network. So 
one way is you start with a big network and then you use the big network to train a small network. It's called a knowledge distillation. So you start with a very big network and then you trim it or you, you use a network to train a smaller network. Uh, another approach is to call an, uh, uh, quantization. So the, uh, the size of the each input layer is like 16 bit or 32 bit and then they can trim it to like 4 bit. Uh, there's a demand to run like real-time face detector on the camera on something like that. Yes, so uh, or on mobile phone. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I want to ask questions about uh, fine-tuning some models. Uh, you said that uh, your data set uh, has a uh, face uh, that uh, the persons wear masks or not. And you say that it's not work when fine tuning. It means that uh, you face uh, in the front of layers, or or you, you mean that uh, you uh, because I, I found that uh, when fine fine tuning, uh, I usually uh, face uh, and tend the head of the layers. After that, uh, we unface or layers and uh, we don't update the weight uh, same as every, uh, every layers but uh, I'm usually uh, update weight and at the deep layers because I want to maintain uh, the general filters at the shallow layers. But uh, you said that fine tuning may be not work. I don't know. No, I, I didn't say fine tuning does not work. I just say that uh, if you start from the network that is most relevant to the task that you want, then the f you know you you need to do little fine tuning, uh. or you require less data to make it work. If you start with something trained on very for different tasks that completely re irrelevant to the task that you care about, then you would need more or you need more trick to make it work. Mm. Okay. But uh, compare from the training from scratch with... Uh, okay, we never... Tr usually I would, uh, I would advise again from training from scratch. It, uh, it, uh, uh, you know, um, because you should start with something that already trained with millions of images and uh, it, it might take like a week to train this network, so you don't want to retrain from thing from scratch, or you have to train the network very long time, and with more a lot of data. Yes, yeah, so so five June maybe uh, have a uh, good filter in the front of layer. Yeah, like so so I, I would say do fine tuning, but starting from the network that you know you think the most relevant to the task. Okay. Sorry, I, I didn't quite catch uh, what, what you end up using uh, uh, for your mass versus no mass problem. Uh, so what, what network did you end up transferring from? I, I don't remember exactly, but my, uh, my student found something that trained for output attribute of the, this, uh, uh, this data set with attribute of the face uh, uh, where it has been trained on those. Uh, so I think that is more relevant to the one trained to preserve identity. Network that trains on the attributes of the face, like output whether the person wearing glasses or does it they have um, beard uh, or some other things like that. Yeah. But but the input of the network is are still images, not the, the attributes. Oh yes, so the input is still a face image, uh, a face uh, image. Yes. But, but the outputs are the, the attributes. The output will train yeah, on the attribute. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Did, uh, another question is the last question. Do you have any questions? Oh, okay. So uh, if there's no more question, let's thank uh, Min Huan again. Thank you, and I see you this afternoon. Thank you.